Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Today, we are talking about women and autism. And this one has been on our list of must-do episodes for, for a while. And... um. It was a suggestion from frequent writer and Jamie. So thank you again, Jamie. Uh, and uh, several people have written in and suggested it a couple years ago, back when I did the uh, video series, the Sminty video series. I was the producer. Kristen, uh, she did an episode, a video episode on on this subject. So it was one that was really enlightening for me. And I'm glad that we're talking about it. Right. And according to several research reports, autism in women actually presents a little differently than in men. And we wanted to talk about those differences and the many misconceptions of women on the autism spectrum or ASD or sometimes autism spectrum conditions or ASC so as to be more inclusive of neurodiversity and to emphasize that people with autism have strengths and difficulties. Yes. And... um This is a topic of much discussion among my friends. Actually, very recently, we uh, got to talking about this. There's so much at play in this conversation when it comes to the socialization of women and girls and how autism does present in women. And then when it comes to stigma, my dad actually refused to have his children tested uh, for autism, um, even when my mom wanted to do it. Because he was afraid that we would encounter stigma, but also he was worried it would mess with our self-esteem or something. Um, right. I know for um, what I've seen today in the field that I was in, in social work with the government and the state, it's really hard to get a test. Actually, it's really difficult to actually ask for a specific test on autism because it's a whole different level in funding as well as who is specialized in it. And it's very rare to find someone in the state uh, level, whether it's they take Medicaid or they don't take Medicaid or they take uh, whatever the state insurance is, that they won't actually do it. It won't be covered. So it's really difficult even to get a test. Right. Uh, And... We did want to put in a disclaimer at the top of this one. This is a really, really complex issue. And uh, when it comes to things like testing and to the research that isn't there, and even the research that is there, uh, and the language that is used, and it's an ongoing conversation, as is the research. But just to put that out there, even things super recent was using terminology that uh, is still debated. So... Right. Just want to put that out there to recognize that. And we were trying to do our best. Um, but that is an ongoing conversation. Right. And just the reminder that it took uh, the DSM a while to rearrange how they spoke about it and how they saw it and seen it as a spectrum and not just a complete diagnosis, which actually was part of the confusion on diagnosing people with autism and what the uh, spectrum actually looks like. We dove really deep, and so some of them are outdated terms, and hopefully we can (laughs) do it justice and and do it correctly. So be patient. Uh, We know that this is a big issue. And again, there are things that people still don't know about autism and what that means for individuals. And we just, uh, we want to delve. And of course, when what we're talking about specifically to women and how it might show up or how it might be seen or how it might be diagnosed. So according to many different reports, the ratio of men versus women who are diagnosed with ASD or the autism spectrum disorder varies from the two to one ratio, meaning two men to one woman, uh, or all the way up to 16 to one. So you have numbers all over the place. And every time I would pick one, every time we would pick one paper, it would say three to one, two to one four to one, five Mm -hmm. to one. So it was definitely all over the place. And there are several different theories as to why more men than women may be diagnosed as also to if they were being diagnosed correctly. Uh, One of the bigger issues that have been stated is that the blanket criteria for diagnosis are not equal. In other words, the main criteria used is 
typically geared toward men and how it reflects on men and in use for all people, which can become problematic when diagnosing and misdiagnosing, and in some cases, a refusal to correctly diagnose at all. And with all that said, um, what is autism spectrum disorder or, as we mentioned, autism spectrum condition? According to the American Psychiatric Association, it is a neurodevelopmental syndrome characterized by difficulties with social reciprocity, social communication, flexibility, and sensory processing. And studies to show gender differences for ASD or ASC is relatively new. Um, as one resource states, the beginning date of researching this was as of 2015, so not that long ago. And one thing that is clear is that the conclusion is still unclear. So there you go. <laughs> Nothing is clear. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and one big consensus seems to be that there may be a level of camouflaging for women in social scenarios to hide social discomfort. So several reports show that women often work to hide or, quote, camouflage their stressors and difficulties to fit in. One study even suggests women are more likely to develop uh, coping mechanisms to adjust to stress or manage the changes around them as opposed to men. And some tactics of camouflage may include not getting too involved in social activities or escapism. And some reports have stated that the level of love or intensity of a specific thing or person could be a part of their coping. And there's also the question of the level of exhaustion and work in order for many females who work to adjust to social norms and the mere stress that can cause, especially for children and young adults. As one report stated that they may quote, suffer social confusion in silence and isolation in the classroom or playground, but she may be a different character at home. The mask is removed. Um, And it's saying that at home, she may be more prone to releasing her bottled up emotions through meltdowns. Yeah, and that's a common theme when I was reading personal accounts Mm -hmm. is this idea of masking and camouflaging. Right. And how... um, Sometimes people didn't even realize they were doing that, that they were mimicking other people's behaviors and that it's exhausting. Right. And that like the word fit in was used often as we were reading that, that it didn't necessarily mean they knew there were, they had autism or they were on the spectrum, but they knew they were different and they tried their best just to fit in. Mm-hmm. And and just to reiterate, the science looking into autism in women specifically is appallingly recent. Even if you... I think like the 1990s might have been the earliest. Um, and past research indicated that women couldn't even be on the spectrum. And that was in scientific papers. That was a conclusion that people found. Um, and this is another instance in a long line of research treating men as the norm and women as a deviation. We've talked about that before, about like even birth control. <laughs> A lot of the early research was on men (laughs) for something that was being developed for women. So this is an issue we've seen many, many times. According to Dr. Robin Young, who recently presented a paper on the possible connection between autism and eating disorders, only 5% of teachers reported having any issues with girls on the autism spectrum. Other research suggests that girls might show more anti-feminine traits and may have a more difficult time developing friendships since female friendships are more likely to lean on emotional connections and nuanced communication. However, there's other research that suggests the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Uh, And despite this, that autistic women are still generally more able to have traditional friendships because they have become so adept at masking. Again... Ongoing research, a lot of conflicting stuff out there you'll find. I find that part of that is due to age, it seems. You see Mm -hmm. how they talk about different diagnoses based on age. So we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And we did want to put in here because it's come up before where there will be sort of this comparison between fangirls and the perhaps what some people see as obsessive, over-the-top, like, I can tell you uh, how, where this person was on this day and when they learned to do this, and kind of that, I, and it, to me, it just reminds me of uh, expertise, and we talked about that in our fangirl episode, um, as being a more mainstream way to present symptoms of autism among women, um, as does, I've read a whole article about calorie counting and eating disorders. And that article, it was really good, but it was a specific account of one person. So I don't know that mm-hmm. you can extrapolate that out, but 
it's worth looking into. Um, and we're gonna we are gonna talk about that the possible relationship between eating disorders and autism in a second. But in general, it seems that boys and men's autism manifest more outwardly and girls and women's more inwardly. So we did want to talk about misdiagnosis of autism in women. But before we do that, we're going to pause for a quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. Right. So we did want to talk a little bit about misdiagnosing of autism in women. And many women have talked about being misdiagnosed with ADHD and anxiety and even depression. And according to one report, women are 42% likely to be misdiagnosed as opposed to men who are misdiagnosed at that 30%. And it's also reported most of the time they're only diagnosed if there's an additional intellectual disability or behavioral issues. But some point at the fact that because they are not properly diagnosed as children, that oftentimes the difficulty in trying to fit in or mask themselves under societal norms leads to the development of anxiety and depression, which is a result of not being able to properly treat the overall issues of those with ASD or ASC. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty interesting because it's not necessarily the actual underlying issue, but it's become a result of, and that says so yeah. much as to, the again, the exhaustion and the level of trying to figure out what is happening. Yeah. Um, and as, in fact, several parents of young girls have reported that many of the doctors continue to disregard possible signs as being, as we said, this is a little bit different, like the opposite of what is being said earlier, of being feminine traits, such as being shyer or maybe right. more passive, or to have excessive interest, therefore are more likely to be ignored. And if young girls were not following social cues, they're often being dismissed as just rude or snobbish. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And as an added result, the number of diagnoses vary from young girls versus women. The ratio of differences for diagnosis goes from five to one young children versus the two or three to one ratio as adults to the male counterpart, which again can be attributed to the lack of acknowledging of specific signs and diagnosis. Many, many, many people when I was reading personal accounts, have described the, the power and the almost instant relief of finally getting that diagnosis of autism, of finally feeling validated and legitimized and heard. Especially a lot of people had stories of going to doctors or even confiding in teachers and being told things like, girls aren't on the autism spectrum or you're you're bad at math and therefore there's no way you can be autistic. Just like these really dismissive behaviors um, and just how damaging that that is. And if you look at the isolation often caused by a delay or misdiagnosis um, and and that exhaustion of trying to mask constantly and some people described a feeling like they were failing, like they constantly were confused and uncertain and that they weren't getting it right and uh, just exhausted. And if you compound that with things like race and gender identity, it makes total sense that when you finally get that the correct diagnosis, how meaningful and powerful and relieving that is. Right. And this could also um, speak to Many of the issues that happen with kids who are at risk for delinquency and issues of delinquency, you see a lot of the times that it's not correctly being addressed. So the kids who have trouble in school, who may be being diagnosed with ADHD and incorrectly given medication, when well, maybe they are on the spectrum and they're not being taught properly or in the manner that they can efficiently learn. So it's a whole big question of, yes, is this a problem? But how big of a problem and what can it cause? And when you look at the trail of kids that are getting in trouble with uh, judicial systems and any of those policies, it's a bigger picture of how we're, again, and I've said this a lot lately, how we're failing in those types of systems. And misdiagnosis is one of those huge proponents. And, and I say earlier, I said earlier that there's not enough testing, there's not enough funding, there's not enough specialists to actually be able to correctly diagnose our children. This is one of those conversations. What is happening and how is it breaking down? And yeah, I could completely see how finally understanding yourself and what, when it clicks of this is what's been happening in my in my mind. These are the chemicals that are, are raging through my head. This makes sense. And just kind of the freedom in understanding yourself a little more when you're properly diagnosed. Yeah. And 
especially when it comes to women, uh, and this is a good segue into our next topic, actually. Uh, I've read many accounts of it being empowering where, um, and I, you know, this isn't the experience of all women of course who uh, are on the spectrum, but for a lot of the accounts I read of feeling more able to be confident in their interactions with people and say no and not feel like that they have to go along with something that they didn't want to do, especially when it comes to dating. Right. Which is what we're talking about now. Next, we wanted to touch on the intersection of women, autism, sex, and sexuality. And there is so, so much to unpack here. Uh, First, there is a misconception that autistic women don't have sex or that they are all asexual, which is not true. Some don't. But others can and do. People on the autism spectrum experience the entire range of gender identity and sexuality spectrums. Uh, And this misconception that autistic women are uninterested in sex is based in part on some flawed studies that didn't take into account how autism may present differently in women. Some research does suggest that the women on the spectrum are in more romantic relationships than men. They are more likely to enjoy solitary sexual behavior. Again, there's really not a lot out there when it comes to this kind of research. And what is out there is fairly limited in uh, sample size. And also, uh, I, and I, I think about this all the time because you, ha- you always have to keep in mind who is conducting the study and why. And maybe if they completely understand, like the way you phrase questions right. um, can be limiting. And they, I've seen a lot of critiques of these studies in terms of how they were conducted and how questions were phrased. So research has found that or uh, suggest that, but another disclaimer, lots of disclaimers in this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we talk about autism and the ASD and ASC in general, it's very limited. Um, and we could talk about that as the way they actually treat But that's a whole different conversation I won't get into. (laughs) Um, So another thing playing into this is how many autistic women have reported an anxiety or confusion around traditional courtship behaviors like small talk, getting ready for dates and dinners, and reading the signals of dating from someone else, and difficulties reading signs of attraction. So autistic women don't uncommonly report an intense focus on a partner to the point of pretty much losing yourself as well. Autistic women are more likely to obsess over people as compared to men who obsess over objects. Yeah, and this, this I relate to so hard. Like that of not understanding social cues and signals and feeling like I'm constantly missing out. I I know I've said it before on here that I feel like there's some level of understanding and communicating that's happening all around me and I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And it scares me. It feels very unsafe because it's just like you are constantly guessing. Um, And that you, there's just like an expectation that you should get it. And I don't get it. (laughs) So I've had to learn to fake it. And I've never gotten tested. Who knows, like, why that is. It could be a lot of different things. But just in particular that, I was like, yep. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Autistic women often report a feeling of being unable to meet socially dictated gender norms, like nurturing. And partly because of that, uh, many accounts I read said uh, they were willing to settle with anyone, quote, willing to be with them. Uh, Lack of sexual education is also an issue in this conversation. Some women described the danger of mimicking a man's flirtation behaviors back at him and not really realizing that they were doing that and that escalating into a situation that they didn't want to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, For hypersensitive people, uh, touching may be uncomfortable while people displaying hyposensitiveness, arousal may be difficult. Science is ongoing into the potential connection between autism and things like sex addiction, sexual preoccupation, sexual compulsivity, hypersexuality, and the link between excessive masturbation and the desire for repetitiveness particularly in that case, and paraphilic behaviors in some cases. But all of this is, yeah, very new. Right. 
And when it comes to the intersection of sexuality and autism, there are not many avenues of conversation or resources available. And again, the research is sparse. Previous and some present studies suggest that perhaps the rate of the LGBTQ plus individuals is higher among people on the autism spectrum. And there's a lot of discussion as to why that might be, if it's if it's even true, honestly. Um, and some research is looking into a link between autism and gender dysmorphia and nonconformity, and the particular set of issues facing autistic gender nonconforming folks and possible treatments that center them. Right. And and just want to put out there, just because there aren't many resources, there are some people doing amazing blogs and sharing their experiences. And um, I read a lot of firsthand experience of people saying how comforting that was that that was out there or like knowing that there were other people going through this when there is this lack of resources. So just to say, there is, there is stuff out there. There is really good stuff out there. Women on the spectrum are at a higher risk of abusive relationships. One small sample size study found over 50% of the participants who were women on the spectrum reported sexual abuse in relationships. Although it is worth noting Other studies who have arrived at similar findings have been called into question for not allowing for complex answers to their questions. Or in the words of Amy Gravino at SpectrumNews.org, quote, Many autistic women sometimes consent to what their idea of a sexual encounter is, but not to what it actually turns out to be. And that, again, goes back to uh, lack of sex education, among several other things. She goes on to talk about the intersection of sexual abuse and trauma and autism, underreporting, not recognize abuse until later, low self-esteem. So all these things getting mixed up in just adding layers of complexity when we have this conversation and getting a real grasp of data and what's actually happening. So we do have some more issues, <laughs> but first we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. We also want to discuss the connection between eating disorders and autism. Some research suggests that girls and women on the autism spectrum are more likely to be diagnosed with anorexia nervosa than boys and men. And on top of that, women and girls are more likely to have their undiagnosed autism misdiagnosed as an eating disorder. And according to recent research from King's College London, depending on the source, anywhere from 4% to 52% of people diagnosed with anorexia meet the criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. Yes, and those are, that's a huge gap, a huge range, as you can see. Yes. Um, And (laughs) those numbers come from a variety of different papers with a variety of different uh, survey methods. So it goes to show how how varied uh, the the research can be around all of this. Right. And there are a couple of theories as to why this potential connection between autism and eating disorders might be. Some believe it's genetic. A gene vulnerability is shared between autism and eating disorders. Others think that girls with undiagnosed or a late diagnosis of autism might increase the risk of secondary mental health problems and an eating disorder would fall under that, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, Samantha. Some resources report that up to 70% of autistic children will also have comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders. Research is ongoing again, 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 and until recently, extremely lacking. Also again, into the potential leaks between autism, trauma, and PTSD. Right. And again, you got to wonder what's the cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Early research suggests autistic men are likelier than women to develop PTSD, though... This could go back to the camouflaging thing. Women in general are more likely to develop PTSD. And again, yes, and they may not be showing it or it might not show out as just regular triggered trauma. Experts also think that things like extreme bullying and feeling overwhelmed and marginalized may contribute to higher rates of trauma, but also things typical researchers have overlooked like loss of routine. It's too early to differentiate between correlation and causation, but it's good that researchers are looking into this and of tailored treatment options, which is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Autistic women and girls in particular are more likely to develop 
anxiety, and depression. Some describe the numbing experience of eating disorders as a coping mechanism when it comes to undiagnosed or misdiagnosed autism and the exhaustion of fitting in or camouflaging and or the difficulty of regulating emotions. So yes, it's really hard for pretty much everything we're talking about here and pretty much everything we talk about ever (laughs) to differentiate causation and correlation. But so so as as you said earlier about how is it a coping mechanism that more people have and specifically women and girls have eating disorders or anxiety or depression? Was it something that came secondary or was it always there? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's a big question, especially with comorbidity types of diagnosis in general and the stress factors that are outside of the norm. So whether it's environmental Mm -hmm. or any of that. And when it comes to the misdiagnosis of autism as an eating disorder, experts think that that might be because people on the spectrum might avoid foods that taste a certain way or have textures that produce certain sensory reactions, crave repetitive eating, or count calories obsessively. And I've also seen that as with clothing too. They're talking about specific to routine. They don't like a specific feeling Mm -hmm. on their skin, so they avoid specific things. So yeah, that's the big question of, is it actually an eating disorder or is it something to do with textural or any of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. So seems like education is a is a big uh, piece of this that we really need to to work on. Uh, Because there is so much more to be done. Uh, We need more research and we need a more comprehensive tailored approach to autism and the intersection that it has with race, gender identity, sexuality, so much else. This lack of understanding, particularly when it comes to women, can and has been so damaging, isolating, and lonely, uh, been associated with a plethora of other negative health outcomes, which we've been talking about. That pain of being dismissed or of not being believed, which we know that in the medical field, we've talked about that before, how women are less likely to be believed, um, of being misunderstood, stigmatized, and being robbed of connecting with the autistic community because of a late diagnosis, and how powerful that connection can be, and how healing or just yeah, legitimizing, validating. That's why this is so important that we're talking about it. And um, it's so late. <laughs> we're having this conversation so late. Right. It kind of seems kind of early because of the lack of data. <laughs> oh, know, for us. Because, yeah, but like yeah, in, yeah. in general. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah. The fact that it's taken this long to get anything, uh, any type of information at all is unfortunate. And, and this goes down to the mere fact of autism in itself that it's not very known. They're doing research and they're trying to get all the misconceptions out of the way first and foremost, which mm-hmm. is... Uh, kind of be problematic, whether that misinformation (laughs) plagues uh, some of the research. But yeah, talking about how do we diagnose it at an early age, who's able to, who has accessibility to get it tested. That's a Mm -hmm. bigger question to me. Again, we've talked about this so many times, who has access to care. And this seems to be a luxury, which it shouldn't be. No. Because it definitely neglects uh, so much for our people how they could benefit, like you said, from having that diagnosis at an early age, whether it's the treatment, whether it's the community, whether it's just a plain understanding of how to communicate with yourself. Yeah. You know, and it's it's unfortunate that it's not just accessible, that it's only given to those with the better medical knowledge as well as money. Yeah. Yeah. And and just I think I read the average age of diagnosis for women is between twenty and thirty. Right. Um, and I've just had, I've had discussions with people about how they heard those misconceptions that girls and women aren't on the spectrum, can't be on the spectrum. Right. And believed that. And so never even considered it. And right. I was just hearing the pain in their voices of how hard they try to camouflage and the that pain. That just sounds exhausting. Yeah. As a person who uh, suffers with depression and anxiety, trying to pretend like I'm okay with that Mm -hmm. is exhausting. And that's not an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And I can't imagine. It's also, it's compounded, I think, for women and girls because there is an increased socialization and conditioning in terms of being a very 
I don't know if outgoing is the right word, but being, I think there are, it's a higher level of expectation of being friendly, of making these connections, of right. kind of being caretakers of our society and our friend being groups. Nurturing. Yeah. yeah. And it just, it seems it, that there is perhaps that expectation gets all twisted up and entangled with this. And the fact that that's what you learn as a child yeah. to be a lady is to be these things. So you know that there's a standard and mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to live up to that yeah. is a whole different level. Yeah, I definitely think that that complicates this whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. And we would love to hear from any listeners, any resources you want to shout out. That would be magnificent. Uh, and you can send those to our email. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Instagram at Stuff I'm Never Told You or on Twitter at MomStuffPodcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Andrew Howard. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I'm Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Hold up. 